I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, long before the beginning of desegregation. If I removed the head wrap that I'm wearing, you would see a lot of gray hair, and that would give you some indication of how long ago that was. Not only were black people living under the practice of segregation, but there were another set of laws known as the Jim Crow laws. Those laws were in place just to make sure that black people were treated as second-class citizens. Some of the examples of how that was done, if a black man and a white woman were meeting each other on the sidewalk, the black man had to step off of the sidewalk until the white woman passed, and if a white woman was picking her maid up to take her to work, the black woman knew that she had to sit in the back seat of the car. If you passed a group of men on a construction job on the side of the road, didn't matter how many black men there were, the lone white man was the boss. Those are just a few examples of how Jim Crow law was carried out. Now, there were many other portions of that law, factions of that law, divisions of that law, that all black parents had to know, practice, and to teach their children. They did that just to make sure their children were safe. So parents told their children, as my mother did, learn to stay in your place. Learn to follow the Jim Crow laws, is what she was saying. That was in my head as a tape all the time. But my sister and I had to walk to school every day. And we walked past a white family's house where two girls lived that were just about our age. They thought it was their privilege every day to taunt us as we passed. They came out and blocked the sidewalk, so my sister and I had to step off into the street. And we did, because you see, I'm listening to my mother's voice saying, Vivian, stay in your place. I tell you, that was hard. But one day, that went on for about a month until one day, I did not hear my mother's voice quite so clearly. I decided I was staying on the sidewalk. So as I approached these girls, the closer I got to them, I dropped my notebook on the sidewalk, walked straight ahead. When I was near enough to them, I know they saw the venom in my eyes because they retreated to their yard and then eventually to the porch. I picked up my notebook, my sister and I walked on, and at that very moment, the calmness I felt was because I had claimed my place on the sidewalk. My resolve was to never give it up. That resolve served me well because along with it came a desire to fend for myself. So another situation arose when I was 14 years old and I had another opportunity to see how bold I could be. My friends and I, because ninth graders do, wanted to dress alike and we decided a couple of days a week we would do that. Now my parents, didn't have a budget that was going to buy new clothes for me to wear every single week. So I decided, since I'm so bold, you see, that I could work and earn my own money. I made this proposition to my parents, and first my mother said no, but now I'm a bold person, so I persisted. Finally, she said yes. I was able to get a job as a maid. Those were the only jobs open to black women at the time. I worked every day after school and on Saturday because I was beginning to feel so comfortable on this sidewalk that allowed me to be bold. As time went on, I had the great fortune to get married and have two awesome sons. And at the same time, I realized that deep in my soul was a dream that had not been realized, and that dream was to become a nurse. So I took a job at Shands Teaching Hospital working the night shift as a nurse's aide. That allowed me to take classes during the day at Santa Fe Community College at that time because Santa Fe opened in 1963 as the only institution of higher learning available to African American or black people. Because I was on the floor with nursing students from the University of Florida, I was in regular contact with them. We worked together. They enjoyed the experience with me, and the dean of nursing came to the floor to look and check on the students. The students told her of their experiences. 
she and I became acquaintances. She found out that I had this desire to be a nurse and that I was already taking classes at Santa Fe College. That led the dean one day to come to me and say, Vivian, if you can complete your Associate of Arts degree, we have scholarship money that will allow you to enter the university in the fall. That was thrilling. I was glad to hear that. But in my heart, the trepidation I felt was because I was 18 quarter hours short of graduating in the fall, and this was a spring term. But Santa Fe on the quarter system offered two summer terms. So I'm bold enough and I can convince anybody of anything. So I was able to complete my search of arts degree and entered the University of Florida in that fall as planned. I thought it was hard getting there. The hard was ahead of me, as I found out. I was the oldest student in the class. I was one of three African Americans admitted to the class. And I was among students who had the opportunity to take the higher sciences in high school. I graduated from a segregated high school 10 years before that was not able to offer those courses because they were not uh, paid for through the county. Hard times, difficult times, impossible, no. Hard, yes. But I was able on this sidewalk where I learned to fend for myself to find the help that I needed. So I continued on and graduated with my Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Florida. At the same time I was a student, I was also an advocate for the city. It seems that I've always been one fighting, desegre fighting segregation. I was lucky enough to find another group of women who were just organized for that purpose. These women were the first integrated group of women in Gainesville, Florida, and they were Gainesville Women for Equal Rights, called GWEER as an acronym. These women looked the city over and they decided that they could affect change in any aspect of the city where they were needed. They did that by setting up committees who went out to find the areas we should work in. Two of those areas that we sought to have input in were in terms of the laws that were coming before the city commission and the county commissioners. The people on that committee found out when there would be issues on the docket that we should have input on. They told us and we attended the commissioner's meetings, often in droves, often a lot of us there, very often, until the commissioners gave us a name. <laughs> they called us the damn women. <laughs> Actually, the, the sentence was, please tell me those damn women will not be here again tonight. Of course we were, and in numbers. I chaired the health care committee, and our job was to find ways to integrate both the doctor's offices and the hospital. You have to realize that during that era, black people entered white doctor's offices through a back door. That back door led into a tiny room, which I call the cubbyhole, because if four chairs were on the wall, straight back chairs, and four chairs facing those two, there was barely enough room for anybody to walk between them. When the patient, black patient, entered that room, they had to announce their presence by looking through a window cut in the wall between the two waiting, room, waiting rooms. You would have thought that window would be high enough to look at at eye level. No, it was just above the chair so that you also had to bend over to let them know you were there. Well, the contrast to that was the white waiting room where there was a mirror on the wall, flowers and flower pots, a coffee pot, soft cushioned chairs, and all of the amenities that we were not privy to. These were the areas that we were into bringing about change. The committee decided that because two of us, the black women on the committee, had pending appointments at their doctors, that on our next visit, we were not going in the back door. Our goal was to walk in the front door, and that's exactly what we did. One woman was pregnant, she went to her obstetrician. I had an appointment with my doctor on Southwest Fourth Avenue, and I went in the front door. We were treated, 
As far as I know, there were no repercussions. Our job then was to spread the word. When you go to your doctor next time, walk in the front door. And that way, we were able to integrate the doctor's offices. But still ahead of us, on this great sidewalk we're walking on, is the integration of the hospitals. All hospitals were set up in such a way that you entered and were placed on the floor based on your condition. If you were there for surgery, you were on the surgical floor. If you were a child, you were on the pediatric floor, and so on. That is if you were white. If you were black, you were placed on the second floor of a life trade general. There was one long room for men on one side of the wall. Facing that was a long room for women. Second floor, no air conditioning, and sitting over the boiler room. Those were the conditions black people suffered under when they were patients. Our job was to bring about change. We made an appointment to visit with the administrator. During our visit, after we were ushered into his office, we were ready to state our case. Now, you have to realize, during that era, white men were in charge, in their minds more than any place else, but they were in charge. And they did not want women, black or white, telling them face to face what to do. Can you imagine this man didn't want a white woman to do it, but this black woman was going to do that because I chaired the committee and that was my job, so I did. We sat in front of him and I said to him, we're here to seek the integration of Elytra General Hospital based on the fact that the funds you receive are through a congressional act called the Hill Burton Law, which says that if you receive these funds, you must not discriminate. You must not discriminate with your staff, nor with the patients you serve. Well, we waited what I call during a pregnant pause because this man didn't answer us right away. Actually, he did in a nonverbal way because at the very top of his white collar, we saw the red streak rising up his neck, headed toward his chin. So just before it reached the top of his chin, he said to us, I will not facilitate integration of this hospital. Well, we didn't think he would, but we had to go there. It wasn't the answer we wanted, but it was the answer we got. And we realized as that streak started getting closer to his ear, it was time for us to go because he was going to explode at any minute. So we got our purses and left. We told our group what we found, and at that point, the Games for Women for Equal Rights decided we needed a broader sidewalk. We needed to open our sidewalk up to others in the community who were working for the same just cause. We took our cause to the very committee who could do something about it. They had funds to hire a lawyer. That lawyer worked with the board of trustees for Elytra General, and eventually, over time, they effected change, and the hospital was finally integrated. Well, the greater work that we were able to do through uniting was, was fabulous. We were able to walk on our sidewalk, and we were able to effect change. I spent all of my adult life working as an advocate for this city that I love very much. I'm encouraged when I hear young people ask, what can I do on this sidewalk of advocacy to bring about a better world? I tell them that we are going to have to create an environment where everyone feels that they are welcome to sit at the table and have a voice across all lines, respecting all differences, so that we can dispel the myths and misconceptions that impede our progress and deny us a change. Also, we must reflect on the sidewalk that those before us have walked on, add our steps to their journey, and if we do, we can all walk two by two on this great American sidewalk to bring about the difference and to make the world a better place. I thank you.